Today, the old man ranting from the kitchen. Once again, Facebook is in the news. Hi, I'm your host, William Lee, podcaster, podcast producer, and the founder of the Kiva Agency for Social Media Marketing. Man, has Facebook outdone themselves this time. You know, the war's been going on about the different changes, hate speech, political statements, and all that that has been on Facebook. And some of us have totally ignored it, understanding that the dictator of Facebook is going to do it his way, or you can just find the highway. So the question came to light, what does the average viewer or reader feel about Facebook? and the information that Facebook puts out, the platform, how it goes together, and all that other good stuff. So instead of getting into a technical mirage of information and trying to break down each and every individual part of the content of what's going on with Facebook, they decided to simply make a poll and break it into three different portions. First, how many people trust Facebook and the information that they use? The second was, do they have little trust in Facebook's content? And the third was, absolutely no opinion at all or options to work with. Now, this required setting up some actual simple questions to masses of different organizations to see if they would post these polls and then feed the information back to the original poll taker. It worked and was very exciting, the results. Let me give you an idea of what happened. There was over a million people that responded to this poll. And out of the million, 65% do not trust Facebook's content or Facebook's policy, period. 21% had little trust in the organization or how Facebook operates. 10% had no opinion at all about Facebook or its operation. Now, out of this, there was... 63% of these poll takers were Caucasian or white. 7% were African Americans. 3% were the American Indians. 2% were Asian. 1% was Hawaiian or Pacific Islander. The rest of the voters, or 28%, were a mixture of different European descents. That's 1 million votes. Can you imagine what... I think would be alarming to Facebook when they found out that people were not trusting their material at all. Now, just recently, one of the great, uh, I would say, social media celebrities of all time, the Kardashians, their campaign was called the One Day Moratorium on uploads to protest what it calls Facebook's repeated failures to address hate speech and election disinformation. A statement made by Kardashian West, who has 188 million followers on Instagram alone, appeared to cause the firm Facebook after she made the statement that she was tired of having this disinformation and hate speech on Facebook. The market value plunged millions in 30 minutes. Although the stock later rebounded, it really telegraphed a wonderful report that, hey, Mr. Dictator, you are not controlling everything, and that we now, the individual readers and viewers of Facebook, have an opinion, and the opinion is we've had enough of lies, hate speeches, and misinformation, which was basically just to wind up the viewers and to make political statements which infuriated different classifications of individuals in America as simple as that you know it was interesting the facebook stock also fell three percent after hours trading on on tuesday when speculation about the possibility now that the federal trade commission antitrust probe was going to start and that the government would be calling the dictator even though we had this terrible epidemic to answer questions in a closed-door meeting. The object, naturally, was to get the dictator to answer what's going on as far as Instagram was concerned and how it might be 
a very strong possibility that Instagram was purchased to knock out any competition to Facebook. The next step was that Kim Kardashian saying that she's freezing her Facebook and Instagram accounts and going to keep them froze for three days. That'd be the 16th, 17th, and the 18th of September. And wanted to see if the followers that she had would just simply not post for three days and walk away from Facebook. Other celebrities that backed up this idea of freezing out for three days and protesting started this movement clear back in May when Katy Perry, Jamie Foxx, and Leonardo DiCaprio made a decision that actually had enough power for Starbucks, Ben & Jerry's, and Verizon to join their resistance to Facebook's absolute mismanagement of content and statements that they were making. Now, as time has gone by, you can find in different articles on the internet that advertisers and even some Facebook employees were totally fed up with Facebook. They even got to the point where they stopped using Facebook because they were tired of spreading the hate, the lies, the conspiracies, and flame our societies. Now, it's very interesting to share with you that this is a part of a problem that's been going on way before this local uprising started. If you can flash back in your memory when we had the campaigns in Egypt and in different European countries, Facebook was at the bottom of this also. And if you can remember right, that when we had investigations really totaling and going through what the actual movement was all about, we found that Facebook was a driving force, that even our worst enemies, ISIS and the rest, had been using Facebook to spread their hate to different countries, which, without a doubt, fired up all of the, dis, I guess, array of civil disobedience and the damages in the human life that was lost. This is because Facebook, in many people's minds and in mine, has grown to the point where it controls now all social media in the world. Now, after the first in May, the uprising started with the Hollywood stars, later on in July, after initial boycott, backlash, Zuckerberg's play down to the impact of the protests, saying it was very wrong to assume that Facebook, quote, had dependent on large advertisers, end of quote. They don't depend on large advertisers. In his statement, he said very clearly that most of the revenue is made through small businesses. Isn't that interesting? And it's true, making it more difficult to target ads that would affect revenue of companies like Facebook, he wrote. But the much bigger cost in such a move would be to reduce the effectiveness of the ads and the opportunity for small businesses to grow. The opposition to Facebook has cited areas that they are concerned about is combating racism, hate, and actually starting civil disobedience. Organizations like ADL, Color of Choice, NCCP, Common Sense, Free Press, National Hispanic Media Coalition, and Last but not least, Sleeping Giants Organization. They're urging Facebook to consider really looking at the content, removing the hate speeches, getting rid of the miscommunication, and the information that is very much so inspired by a political source and or a hate group. They want to clean up the violence and quit spreading this information of violence throughout the world. It's as simple as that. The question comes to my mind is how much longer are we going to, as American citizens or people of the world that want to stop this violence and activity that goes on in our communities and in our streets that is really definitely brought into our homes via Facebook and other platforms that spread hate. It's as simple as that. Now let's look at the other side of the coin. Our constitutional rights give the dictator the right to freedom of speech. And that's very true. It does. And he also has the right to his own opinions 
and he is an entrepreneur. The problem rises that in his own little world of being the dictator, he feels that with the power and the money that he has with the freedom of speech, that he can pretty well, shall we say, push you into his beliefs. And without having a true conscience of right and wrong, as far as I'm personally concerned that he does not own, then it is like, wow, the power I have, the money I have, I can do whatever I want to do. And I think this really truly shows in what has happened just recently, even after the strike was over. The problem that came up next was one of the biggest statements that he's ever made to Congress, which if the American public would listen to it carefully, undermines the fact that he talks out of two sides of his face, stating one thing at one time and then coming up with a polished, shall we say, written speech by his $1,250 an hour lawyers. Here's the example that proves this point, to, at least to me. This is a audio cut from the investigation by Congress of what is going on with Instagram and how it was purchased. And I want you to listen very closely to what the emperor had to say. I've always been clear that we viewed Instagram both as a competitor and as a complement to our services. In your own words, you purchased Instagram to neutralize a competitive threat. If this was an illegal merger at the time of the transaction, why shouldn't Instagram now be broken off into a separate company? Well, Congressman, I, I think the FTC had all of these documents and reviewed this and unanimously voted at the time not to challenge the acquisition. I mean, I think with hindsight, it probably looks like obvious that Instagram would have reached the scale that it has today. But at the time, it was far from obvious. It was not a guarantee that Instagram was going to succeed. The acquisition has done wildly well, largely because uh, not just of the founder's talent, but because we invested heavily in building up the infrastructure um, and promoting it and, and working on security and working on a lot of things around this. And I, I think that this has been an American success story. Now, please notice in that soundbite, two things that really stand out. Number one, he is saying to America that Instagram was not a threat that it was it was a good platform, but it wasn't a threat at all. In fact, he made it very clear that, number one, that was legally purchased and that the government had all the paperwork in front of them, ins and outs, side deals, and everything that was being put together by the emperor of the social media world and empire that he's built. Also in the conversation, you'll really notice that when he started his spiel about what was going on with the purchase of Instagram, he pretty well made it very clear that the founders, the original founders and owner of Instagram, really didn't have everything put together without his touch. In other words, he felt in his mind that it would not have been as spectacular as it is now, I believe, if he hadn't have put in inner structure and advertising dollars, etc., how can you actually, with a straight face in front of Congress, when they have the information of a statement you have made to the press to begin with, and then when you're asked under oath what's going on, you change your answer? Isn't that an interesting point? He makes it very clear that uh, he did not assume that Instagram was a competitor. Folks, Instagram was a big competitor against Facebook. Why would he make a cash offer to the founders and the developers of Instagram and then in turn invite them into the family of Facebook to operate Instagram while he oversees the operation. In other words, they were filling the content and putting Instagram on the map. So there wouldn't be a big change and the general population or users of Instagram wouldn't get, shall we say, nervous and, well, leave. Now, the reason that Instagram also was going so fast and furious in the growth that, of course, the emperor will not admit was the factor that a lot of people were leaving Facebook, the younger generation from 25 down, that were users of Facebook, were leaving because they didn't like the format. They didn't want 
of the actual content. They didn't like things that were being set up. They were kind of, well, shall we say rebellious because a lot of older people had moved into 